This year's Rounds of Working Artist Project Fellows was selected by Marcella Guerrero. She is the Jennifer Rubio Associate Curator at the Whitney Museum of American Art in New York. Erin Jane Nelson is an Atlanta-based artist and writer who received her BFA from the Cooper Union School of Art in 2011. She will be included in the forthcoming 2021 New Museum Triennial Hardwater Soft Stone in New York this October. Her work has recently been exhibited in Making Knowing Craft in Art 1950-2019 and Between the Waters at the Whitney Museum of American Art in New York. Otherworldly at the Friet Museum, Lou Warden in the Netherlands, and I probably didn't pronounce that right, um, and Photography Today, Public-Private Relations at Pinacotheque de Moderne in Munich. She has had solo shows at Atlanta Com Contemporary Art Center, Chapter, New York City, and Document Chicago. Nelson is a 2020 recipient of the Rabkin Award for Arts Journalism, her work is included in numerous institutional and public collections such as the Whitney, the Fritz Museum, and Cadist USA, San Francisco, um, and has been featured in publications such as the Freeze Magazine, Culture Magazine, New York Times Tea Magazine, the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, the Chicago Tribune, and the Contemporary Art Review, Los Angeles. Now I'm going to introduce Erin. Um, Hi. So thanks for coming, and I wanted to shout out to my studio apprentice, Emily, who's here, who helped me work on the show. Um, I'm just embarrassing her. And yeah, thanks to everyone at MoCA for the help putting things together, install, all of the support. It's been really um, nice to work on a show for you know my hometown and to really experiment and have support, especially during COVID. So um, most of my work, prior to this exhibition has largely involved research and travel and um, documenting specifically sites of um, ecological devastation in the southeast, um, including barrier islands and threatened coastal regions. Um, and to a certain degree has kind of always involved interacting with the world, the outside world, interacting with histories and interacting with places. Um, so as you can imagine, the last year and a half has been a challenge, and it's been especially challenging to think about um, how to reorient my practice in such a kind of private, insular, homebound um, world that we live in right now. Um, so the show came together around the ceramic alarm bells that you see on all of the armatures, the frog armatures. And I had started to make these ceramic bells, which I thought of as alarm bells, in January and February of 2020. Um, but very soon they became loaded with all of this extra kind of doom and gloom and alarm as like we as a society have kind of borne witness to many different crises and pandemics. Um, not that they weren't there before, but certainly the sense of alarm and the sense of foreboding has been heightened um, in our world. So. Um, I knew that I wanted to focus on the bells and a framing for the bells in this show. And as I worked, I really um, started to think about the ways in which um, the ecological crisis and climate change and climate collapse is often thought of as, um, especially in the history of art, as something you know where you just need to document things to change heart and minds. You just need to show people what they don't understand. You just need to teach people something about you know science and the natural world. Um, and I think what I've always felt, and I think what um, a lot of artists who are working with issues of climate change are starting to recognize now, um, is how much our ecological moment is tied to the his history, colonial history, um, economic history, uh, racial histories. There's, you know, everything is really interrelated. And so um, I've always thought of my work as being from um, a place of concern and care for the natural world, but mediated through these different um, cultural touchstones outside and beyond the, the climate crisis. Um, so f in this particular exhibition, thinking about the alarm bells and thinking about that background. Um, I was also really thinking about the fact that we were living through a pandemic and seeing kind of the effects of mass death and 
you know, the kind of cataclysmic thing that happens when all of a sudden there's this new invisible force that's challenging our very survival. Um, and it occurred to me as I was working on the work um, that, you know, to a certain degree, pandemics have been happening on smaller and different scales for quite a while. And especially in the last 20 years, a lot of my interests have to do specifically with animals, um, fungi, and plants. Um, and so I had been thinking about this particular fungus, um, the chytrid fungus, that has been essentially ravaging amphibian populations throughout the globe. There's been, I think, a loss of about one-fifth of all amphibians on Earth in the last 20 years. Um, and it's projected to, I think, eliminate another third of those populations if something isn't done. So a lot of that um, fungal growth <laughs> is due to globalization and global trade. So it tends to follow people and follow goods that are bought and sold and travel um, between countries. And I guess as you know, with this in mind and also thinking about, um, you know, the invisible threat of COVID as this kind of microbial thing that we couldn't see but we're deeply afraid of. Um, I also began to think about, you know, what it means when something biological keeps you trapped somewhere, it keeps you kind of stuck in your home, it keeps you stuck in your community, um, it threatens your ability to move freely throughout the world and kind of shatters this illusion that, you know, we can move um, across borders, we can travel, we can see people without any consequences. Um, essentially, like that freedom has precipitated a lot of the climate factors and the exacerbation of climate change, particularly through invasive species. So I began to think about invasive species, specifically fun fungus and plants and things like that, as these kind of um, forces that really digest and degrade national borders. They really call into question like what the edges of an ecosystem are. They really start to like weird and warp and change environments that have largely been the same for thousands of years. Um, and to a certain degree, I mean, we could think of COVID as an invasive species, I certainly would. Um, but this definitely came into mind as I was stuck in my home out in Stone Mountain, um, feeling really trapped both emotionally, mentally, physically, and trying to understand how to make art as someone who had always been kind of reacting to and engaging with an outside world. Um, and I moved into a home, in, a new, a new home in, in June of 2020. And the first thing that it occurred to me to do was to start um, building gardens. I had lived in cities without green space for about a decade. And this was the first time that I'd had my own kind of green space. And as I was working, I immediately started to realize just how much invasive um, insects, invasive fun fungi, invasive uh, plants had just completely decimated the natural environment of this like little half acre that I was living on. Um, and so I started to become very obsessed with gardening and started to think about um, the garden and soil and the sort of microbiome that lives under our feet and in the dirt. And so this is all just kind of the background of things that I was thinking about working on this show. Um, as you can imagine, <laughs> someone who just like thinks a lot, but then just kind of makes things with, with abandon. Um, and that's always how my practice has worked. It involves a lot of research and a lot of accumulation of ideas, of source imagery, of kind of cultural, cultural touchstones. And then really, like I think what I'm most excited by is um, collage and kind of combining mixed media. So um, the show, I think, breaks down into about three different bodies of work, pretty much. Um, so the frogs and the alarm bells are one. And the frogs and the alarm bells are really structured around this idea of the triple goddess, which is, um, it comes, I think, from like paganism or druidism, some kind of ancient religion. And it's this idea of um, essentially like the divine feminine force in the world being split in the singular triple goddess. And the triple goddess contains the three phases of a woman's life and how that life kind of shows the totality of what it means to be a person. And so there's the maiden, there's the mother, and there's the crone. Um, and in particular, as I've been thinking about the climate crisis and thinking about what it means to be an artist making work now, what it means to be a woman <laughs> in this moment, um, a lot of my orientation has been around resisting motherhood and resisting um, having children just out of personal 
will and desire. And so I've been in this moment where amid all of the kind of chaos and collapse around me, I'm also denying this kind of like rite of passage that is often um, the thing that makes women's lives largely. It's like, part, it's like the grand narrative of women's lives as it's been conditioned over centuries and centuries. Um, so I was thinking about the fact that, you know, here I am denying this huge part of a life cycle, a traditional life cycle, and having to reimagine and kind of adapt my life on my own terms um, in spite of, you know, cultural and social pressures. And it really made me think about the ways that our ecosystems are also getting weirded and adapting and having to reimagine their way of being on their own terms. Um, so that's really the thinking behind the frogs. And then also thinking about um, the ways in which like life and death always live together in our world. You know, there, we, we understand and appreciate life because we know that there is death. And certainly death and decay and life cycles has been, I think, something we've all been thinking about over the last year and a half. The frogs, um, so that's the frogs, that's the alarm bells. <laughs> and I'm really excited about them. This is the first time I've made large scale sculpture in the round and specifically like large steel sculpture. And the second I finished them, I wanted to remake them in a totally different way and build on them. And so it feels like this really exciting jumping off point um, that I might not have had um, if not for this exhibition opportunity. So it feels like the first draft of a uh, place where I'd like to go in the future, which is really exciting. Um, the second body of work, body of work, or type of work in the show are these ceramic um, panels, essentially. And I started to make these wall ceramics um, about three years ago around the Barrier Island work. And that was largely using this idea, and I was drawn to clay in part because clay is really like what we see when we see the ground, what we see when we see sand. And so as I was documenting and thinking about these places that were eroding and crumbling and ceasing to exist, to take something like clay, which is ultimately sand and earth, and to fix it into something permanent and something hard, um, felt like this really nice kind of reversal or this kind of poetic act that I could take against that sort of um, entropy. And so there's two ceramic pieces in the show. There's this one, and there's one over here. And when I started to make the Barrier Island work, I was really just thinking about the forms, almost evoking what an island might look like, thinking about a kind of um, abstract geographic form. Um, and as I started to work and as I was thinking about these things like invasive species and adaptations and fungi and strange life cycles, I started to really morph them from being these kind of static geologic monuments to something that became almost creature-like. Um, that's something that maybe became infected and started to have things like tentacle feelers and nodes and um, receptors on them. So. I'm excited also that the show has been an opportunity to really expand how I'm making this kind of work. And then the final three pieces in the show are these textile panels. Um, when I started to make work, um, when I moved back to Atlanta in 2016, I was largely making these photographic quilts that were combining my own photo archive with the traditions of quilting, in particular improvisational southern quilting. Um, and I was drawn to that in part because I had been trained formally in photography when I was an undergrad and was really fed up with this idea of photography being a fixed thing that has to be a piece of paper that's a rectangle that's framed. Um, and so I was always thinking of ways to agitate against that and to complicate what an image could be physically, what it could be materially. Um, and so I experimented with printing on metal, printing on textiles. Um, and so these panels are sort of um, the evolution of that process over the last few years. And I've begun to put them on these um, forms that are meant to kind of mimic like a natural form, like a, a skull, or to mimic a Rorschach, or to mimic um, something that's kind of symmetrical, but kind of not, to make you think that it's almost something that could be natural, but kind of not. Um, and so these pieces also sort of track along that idea of the triple goddess. So I was thinking about the piece with the nest as sort of um, the maiden or the birth. Um, I was thinking about this 
portrait of my dog as the mother <laughs> um, because you know when you don't mother children you inevitably mother other things um, and then I was thinking of this kind of frozen sewer drain as the crone or the kind of end point um, and yeah so there's a bit of synchronicity between the works and these kind of um, thoughts and ideas in them um, but I definitely wanted to use this as an opportunity to really play and to kind of work across mediums and to really sort of explore these ideas of um, invisible, invasive forces around us and um, the uneasiness, but also the ways in which those forces um, allow us to imagine adapting and changing and what um, our future could look like and what our future ecology could look like, what our future bodies could look like. Um, yeah. The process, yeah, yeah. So there's um, kind of building off this idea of making photographic quilts. When you make a quilt, essentially what you're doing is you're taking scraps of fabric and you're sewing them together to make a composition or a painting or a blanket. Um, and so I've taken that sort of same structure, particularly you can see it in this one over here where there's um, one kind of found fabric around it and then two um, fabric photos that are kind of sewn together. So I start by making essentially what is a quilt top, um, or what could be called a quilt top, which is you know collage together fabric pieces. And then I make, um, I use a lot of stencils in my work. I do, I've never shown drawings, but I'm like a very avid drawer. And so most of my forms start as drawings. And so in this case, I make stencils and cut plywood, yeah, to form. And then I take these quilt tops, I stretch them, and then I use that as a base. That becomes sort of like the canvas to build up from. And I build up on that with things like, in this case, epoxy and color pencil drawings and latex and ceramic elements. The um, shelf mushrooms in these pieces are ceramic. Um, but yeah, I love to kind of like clash materials together and I feel like I'm someone who worries and thinks and reads and listens a lot. And so as I kind of process things, I like to process them by like chewing on materials is like how I think about it or like digesting materials. So I love to kind of just like, and then what if I do this? And then what if I do this? And then what I do if, if I do this? And then I think the question is really like when to stop. So um, this show is definitely, um, the size of the space invites you to kind of like fill it with objects and I really wanted to experiment with letting things breathe and kind of because the pieces are so maximal like letting them each have kind of their own moment and their own kind of breathing room. I definitely wanted the frogs even though they are they do feel like the kind of larger sculptures that I've made to have their own kind of like shadow and presence um, and to become almost like a wall drawing. And so um, also thinking about the kind of this history of the photographic and this idea of um, visibility and invisibility to really kind of spotlight um, these frogs and these animals. Um, and then use that also as a device to kind of make drawings on the wall felt important to me. And I'm really interested in my work in using kind of like the theater of exhibition making. Um, there are times where I just want to show a group of, you know, objects in a normally lit white walled room, but a lot of times I'll do things like make, I'll paint half the walls or do something site specific. And so that felt like a way to really create um, an atmosphere that both felt kind of calming and private um, and cool, but also that kind of felt a little bit like ominous and really out, like moved the frogs into their own environments. Yeah, I think that, I mean, kind of what you said is like both what is like problematic and also interesting about it. Like it's the, the whole, you know, in this sort of like framework, there's, um, I think like the male counterpart is just like a singular being that just is and is sort of like based off of a steed um, or, or a stag. That's what it is, a stag. Um, and then so the counterpoint to the stag is the triple goddess and it's tied to things like, um, the Mayfest and like the spring flower. And so the, the, the entire understanding of like um, female power, female spirituality is oriented around whether you're about to be fertile, currently fertile or past fertility. <laughs> and so trying to think about like taking something like that, that does have this kind of, you know, hundreds and thousands of years of history as kind of a social construct um, and then adapting it to my own devices, which is about denying 
those impulses. Um, that's a bit where I came from, but yeah, it's that classic thing where um, there's like this uh, writer that I like who, you know, there's two types of being. There's human beings who just get to be, and there's human givers, and oftentimes women are the human givers. They live in this kind of other category where their value is associated with their ability to parent or to be a wife. Um, and these are very old kind of tropes I feel like feminism has been working on forever, but um, I also kind of like this idea that like women contain all of time in every moment that they're alive. Yeah, I think it's definitely more a process of like how I am in the world than like maybe my art practice, but I would say like definitely these alternative forms of care and kind of in the West and specifically in the US, we have this kind of idea of like the artist as like a singular genius who makes things alone and has these kind of like revelatory ideas that they and only they can have. And I think I've always oriented things around like, I know that my ideas are borrowed. I know that I am collaborating with my ancestors, with people in the future, with my contemporaries. Um, and I really think of I'm, while I'm a very private person and a private maker, I definitely think that these ideas of being a steward or like caring for the people around you is a big part of my life. Obviously, I work um, in service of like other artists <laughs> and write in service of other artists most of the time, um, and that is I, that feels like in, incredibly important to how I am. Um, and then there's a lot of conversations, specifically in queer and disabled communities, um, about other forms of, yeah, like being a doula, like being a disability doula, or being, you know, these kind of taking the framework and the energy and these kind of cultural constructs around motherhood and care and nurturing and even gestation and applying them to different forms of showing up for and your actually, community. It's funny that you say that. I've been working on this essay that I think is actually maybe going to become a book that's called Gestational Abstraction, that's looking at specifically um, at women and queer artists from the 20th and 21st century who have these kind of like totally consuming master artworks that happen when they're like 28 to 45. <laughs> and I love like, I was thinking specifically um, I was asked to speak on a panel about Jada Feo, who made this piece called The Rose that she worked on for nine years. And she worked on it during basically her like fertile years and never had children. And similarly, um, Louise Nevelson had the same kind of orientation to her practice. Um, Lee Bontecu, Eva Hesse, like these are all people who built a, pro a practice around abstraction, a practice around um, deeply tactile and strange object making during these like same moments in their life that I'm at now. And I think it's also extends in, especially in like the 80s and like queer art was a lot, you know, had a lot of this sort of deep total practices and deep total works of art. Um, so that's something I'm thinking about, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. I worked with Jane Foley, who's another amazing artist in Atlanta, to produce the bells. And so, like I said, I, I draw a lot. And so I'd been making these kind of like silly stick figure drawings. And I'd been wanting to essentially make a bell tower for the pieces, but I couldn't really think about like formally what a bell tower would look like. And then I was thinking about um, this obsession with kind of small, minute microorganisms and smallness. And so I was like, what if I take something that is threatened and is um, experiencing, you know, a pandemic of its own and make that the kind of armature for holding these alarm bells. Um, and I would say like decisions around what images and collage, I would say that that comes from a very like intuitive and sort of reactive place. I don't do a lot of like planning. Um, there's definitely connections that I can kind of draw out after the fact, but I try to like de-intellectualize while I'm making those decisions and like think from different parts rather than just like and then I did this because of this um, and kind of just let like my gut take me in terms of what feels right with formally with the glaze with the energy that I'm trying to have the have the piece evoke um, and these were particularly fun because I knew that I wanted to have them powder coated like motorcycles. So I took them to a motorcycle powder coating shop <laughs> out in Buford. And so they have these like very dark glittery like Harley Davidson roller rink like weird <laughs> patinas to them, which um, feels exciting to me.
Yeah, I think like one of the feelings that I had once I saw everything together was that I really liked the frogs as kind of a starting point, but I think that I'd love to push them into an even more abstracted place um, in the future and really think about, um, yeah, the ways that I'm making shapes in other parts of my work, the ceramics and the panels, and kind of reach that with sculpture in the round and armatures. Y yeah, I started making these type of ceramic forms, which are like, it's been building up from this one, I just made one one summer. It was like this kind of hand-built form in the shape of a heart that was kind of like a tray, but inverted. And I knew that I wanted to, I'm really interested in like, how can I make a canvas or like a substrate that isn't just a piece of paper or a stretched canvas or a rectangle? And so whether it's, um, you know, using wood forms or other kinds of things, I'm always like interested in like these materials that change kind of like the foundation of a piece, if that makes sense. Like it changes just like its core and its nature. Um, and so I started to make the ceramic from that one point. I guess that was about four years ago. And so um, I hadn't intended for it to be an artwork. I was just like making things for fun. And then I was like, but what if I add this to it? And what if I add this to it? And it, um, I was mostly making ceramics as a hobby and making pottery. Um, and then kind of just built out from there. And the pieces have definitely grown. I mean, there's definitely still elements of pottery. So for instance, these mushrooms I throw on the wheel. These tentacles I make in the same way that you would like pull a handle <laughs> for a cup. And so I'd like to kind of take these, yeah, like more domestic or traditional ways of making pottery and ceramics and like adapting them to how I want to use them in an art practice thoughts with you guys and, and thank you for coming out on a rainy Tuesday well, night. Thank you. <laughs>